What's up, everyone? Welcome to this day in Philly Sports History for September 13th, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Montgomery. Welcome to a Feel Good Friday edition of the podcast. An extra long weekend wait for Football Friday, but that's okay. Monday Night Football, Nick Foles Night, but I'm all here for it. It's going to be another beautiful day in the area. Loving these fall days. Yesterday was a little hot, not going to lie. At soccer practice, I was caught a little bit off guard, but that's okay. Before we get into today's show, still a little bit of housekeeping. Check me out on social media, Jimbo underscore Mont, Twitter and TikTok, at Philly Jimbo on Instagram. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jimbo underscore Mont. Still working on some things. It's been a crazy couple weeks at work getting the school year underway. But I do have some ideas and and things lined up. So stay tuned for that. Best way to stay in the loop. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. All helps with the algorithm. You know, uh, ultimately spread the word. YouTube, Jimbo underscore Mop. But spread the word. Word of mouth is the best way. If you like it, tell your friends, tell your family. Hell, tell your enemies, tell your kids, teacher, back to school night. Whatever you got to do, tell them they need to be listening to this day in Philly Sports History every day. All right. Huge weekend series versus the Mets. I'm all here for it. And quite honestly, to me, the the Phillies Mets, and as much as I say the Braves have overtaken the Mets and the Braves might be one of my top rivals currently in Philly sports, nothing is better than Phillies Mets, especially when both teams are good. And, And I think that's the key. Uh, it, it, the Mets beat up on us. We beat up on them when the other the other team is not good. But there is nothing better than Phillies Mets when both teams are good. And it, this is the first time there's been a meaningful series between the Phillies and the Mets, uh, really since 2008. So sign me up. Seven games in the next ten days against the Mets. Phillies currently have an eight game lead over the Mets. So. It's going to take an epic collapse. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, 1964, um, or for the Mets, 2007, 2008. But the Mets are fighting for their playoff life. So this is going to be a good series. I fully expect Grimace to be in full effect at Citizens Bank Park. Mets fans always travel well to Philly. Same way with Phillies up to City Park or City Field. So it should be a fun weekend. I, and again, like I, no Eagles football this weekend, so I'm going to be locked into this series. And the Phillies can really do some damage and and whittle away that magic number with a good series against the Mets. Need to take two out of three. And what better way to whittle away the magic number than going against the Mets? I mean, I I can't think of a better way. Uh, JT should be back. Kyle Schwarber looks like he's going to play tonight. Uh, and Mundo Sosa won't be back until Monday in Milwaukee. Uh, Alec Bohm is still struggling to swing a bat. Still got almost three and a half weeks or so before playoffs, so I'm not overly concerned. I do want him to be able to get some bats in the regular season so he's ready to hit the ground running once the playoffs start. But, man, this is lining up to be an epic series. And uh, Nola versus Quintana tonight. Uh, Nola, I feel like, is a different pitcher at home. Uh, he's a big game pitcher. We all we, we know playoff Nola. We need playoff Nola tonight, not Nola from the other night. Uh, Jose Alvarado, I meant to mention this yesterday. Uh, he's looking pretty good. Past, past two starts, uh, I mentioned it the other night, but again, the other um, what was that? Uh, Wednesday night against the Rays looked good again. And I think he could be a wild card for this team with the way Strom and Hoffman has been pitching. And then Estevez, if you have a, a clicking and rolling on all cil- cylinders, Jose Alvarado, look out. But Phillies Mets tonight. Mike, I'm coming for you. Be ready. It's on. I know you've been talking a little bit of trash here off on the clashing conferences, and that's okay. I expect that. I, I, don't worry. I didn't forget about you. Just haven't been on my radar because I've been so focused on the Braves, but now it's the Mets. Mike, I know you're listening. Let's go, Phils. Uh, the magic number to win the division now is nine games to clinch a playoff spot at seven. They got a comfy four game lead over Milwaukee for the second seed. 
technically, I guess it's a two-game lead over the Dodgers. It's one game, but because the Phillies have the tiebreaker. But none of that matters because it's Phillies Mets seven times in the next 10 days. Again, sign me up because I, there's nothing I love better than the Phillies winning than to see the Mets losing. So here we go. And and bring on Grimace, Mr. Met, Mrs. Met, all of that craziness. Let's go. Bring it on. And Lewis, I got your back, brother. I got your back. Be sure to check out Mike and Lewis on the Clashing Conferences Baseball Podcast. New episode dropped today. Doing great things over there. Two good guys. Um, Paul as well, uh, represents, even though it's the Braves. Uh, doing great things. But So be sure to check them out. Uh, anywhere you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. The OGs for the NFL version came out yesterday. Um, and Topher's still talking that dumb shit. And, and that's okay. But go give those guys a, a, a listen. They're doing great things over there. It's a lot of fun. The Clashing Conferences podcast, wherever you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. And then gear up. Get ready. Flyers start rookie camp yesterday. Going to see our first Mishkov action today in the uh, rookie game against the Rangers. Gear up for the Flyers. Sixers are right around the corner. Not too late to get Eagles stuff. Get ready for the Red October. Whatever you need to do, go to Philly Goat. They have you covered. They do great things for charity work as well. Get the John Cruck is my spirit animal shirt. Uh, Whatever you need, they got you covered. So go check out Philly Goat. Be sure to use that promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off your order. That's phillygoat.com. Promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off your order. And muck the fence. If you know, you know. All right, some Eagles news as we're gearing up for that Monday night, Nick Foles night. Uh, relatively healthy heading into this game. Milton Williams was the only one on the injury report, and he still logged a limited practice, so the Eagles should be healthy for this. Apparently, Isaiah Rogers broke his hand, had surgery a few weeks ago. Uh, he's battling back, but he was a full participant in practice, which is going to be key to have some depth and rotation in that secondary uh, Devin White uh, was a full participant in practice, still dealing with some inflammation in his ankle. But I wanted to mention they he had a press conference yesterday, and it, it was it, it was interesting. And we're going to see culture wise what uh, Nick Sirianni can do. But White essentially was surprised that he did not get the starting linebacker uh, nod. Did all the reps for the most part in practice with the first team, uh, and then they decided to go with, um, oh, why can't I even think of his name right now, uh, but uh, Nicobe Dean. So they decided to go with Nicobe Dean instead. I don't know if that's an indictment on the way both teams or both guys played, whether it's Howie saying we need to see what Nicobe Dean is uh, or whatever it is, but to Devin's credit, he handled it like a professional. He was like, listen, it's football. I, I get it. Uh, I'm locked in. I, I got to be ready if my number's called. And, and again, that's a sign of a true professional. However, I, I want to keep this. I'm not saying that he's that kind of guy, but it's one of those things. We know that, especially after last year, this locker room can be <clears throat> excuse me, somewhat fragile. So I want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on that, but for, for his part, I, I'll give kudos to Devin White for the way he handled it. Said he's got to be ready. He's locked in, uh, and I look for him. It could be a, a blessing in disguise for the Eagles because when he gets on the field, he might be ready to, to make some plays and do things. And with the way the defense played down in Brazil, I don't think it, it, you you got to take whatever you can get from these guys. Uh, and speaking of that, Bryce Huff also spoke, said that the field was tough, said it felt like he was running in sand, but he watched the film and he didn't think it was as bad as everybody thought it was. He uh, said there was a couple times he should have had sacks, but he slipped. And okay, that's not necessarily what I saw, but I didn't break down the film the way he did. But we over we tend to overreact either way after the first week. So We'll give you a mulligan on that one. Let's see what happens on Monday night. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into the breakdown because I'll do that Monday. But the, you can't let Kirk Cousins just sit back there and pick you apart. So they're going to need to get some pressure. And 
if what Bryce said is true, he should be able to do it. And and we'll see what happens. Uh, but that's what he said. I'll give him the mulligan on this one because the field was atrocious. Uh, we still got the win. But that, that pass rush is, is definitely something we need to watch. So speaking of that pass rush, let's recap yesterday's question of the day. I asked you, should the Eagles kick the tires and, and think about bringing Hassan Reddick? 74% of you said yes. I, I, I don't disagree. I, I think it's going to be difficult because you have, like I mentioned, two very stubborn GMs. But, I mean, once we see what happens on Monday night, it might be how we might have to just suck it up and say, hey, Joe, let, let, let's work out a deal here, make everyone happy. But thank you, as always, for participating in the question of the day. There will be another one later in the show. Quick Sixers news. Uh, after the whole town hall meeting that uh, the mayor had, I guess it was, at, I don't know if it was at City Hall or down in Chinatown, miraculously, a, an artist rendering of what the arena would look like on the Camden waterfront came out. It looked awesome, uh, but it's it's starting to to spark speculation and I still personally think it's just a, a ploy to get the city to to approve building the stadium with 10th and Market. But I don't know. For me, it's not necessarily going to change the the amount of Sixers games I go to just because it, it's expensive to take a family of four anywhere. And I have so much tied up in Eagles tickets and then trying to get to a, a Phillies game or two a year that – if my parents or my in-laws want to buy us tickets to Sixers, I'll go to South Philly, 10th and Market, Camden, wherever we're going to go. It's just, it's not in the budget, so to speak. But, I mean, people still go down to Camden for concerts and things like that. So, I, everybody's saying, I don't think anybody wants them to leave Philly. Um, and I know, myself included, I tend to make fun of the Giants all the time for playing in New Jersey. Um, and then, I mean, I guess I would have to make fun of myself because my Philadelphia 76ers would technically be the Camden 76ers. But we'll see how this plays out. It's, if you're following this story, it's, it's very interesting. And I still think all of this is just a ploy from the Sixers to try to get the city to approve the 10th and market. But we'll see. I mentioned the Mishkov debut tonight in a Flyers jersey. Rookie game against the Rangers. Uh, I think they're playing at PPL up in Allentown. Uh, time to get excited for Flyers. I, and I, I was high on the Flyers last year, telling you to get in on the ground floor. It's still not too late. Hop on the bandwagon now. This team is going to be good in a couple of years. So taking all comers. And, and I'm not even the biggest Flyers fan. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of the hardcore Flyers fans. Um, hopefully they want us to be on the bandwagon, but I'm telling you, you can get on my bandwagon. Let's go get excited. Uh, I don't know if that game is on TV or not, but I'll certainly be looking for some Mishkov highlights. All right, sticking with the Eagles now, we're going to go back to 1987. And on this day, 1987, the Eagles lost their opener to Washington 34-24 to down in D.C. They fell behind 10-0 in the first quarter, but battled back. Unfortunately, the young team couldn't overcome their mistakes. They had blown coverages, uh, turnovers. They went for a 4th and 27 fake punt, uh, which I was reading in the newspaper archive from that. And Buddy Ryan didn't know who called it. Uh, he blamed the special teams coach. So in typical Buddy Ryan fashion. Uh, I, I wouldn't put, put it past Buddy to call a 4th and 27 fake punt. Just was a disaster. However, from an Eagles standpoint, there were a lot of positives to uh, take away from this. The offense looked decent, which they had struggled in the preseason. Uh, this was really the first year I remember watching and being invested in the game. So I remember the preseason, they looked terrible. Uh, Randall went 21 for 36, 269 yards, a touchdown to Mike Quick. Did throw two interceptions, though, and lost a fumble. But that goes back, one, I think, to him being young, and two, just Buddy Ryan not really coaching him and not caring. Reggie White had his basically his coming out party. He was a rookie in 86, but he had a sack and a forced fumble 
or I'm sorry, not a forced fumble, a fumble recovery in which he took 70 yards for a touchdown. The Eagles, though, turned the ball over four times and against a team that was as good as Washington, who would go on to win the Super Bowl that year, four turnovers is not going to cut it. But you, you cut down the mistakes from a young team, and the Eagles did not play bad in this first uh, real season of Randall being the starter and Buddy really having his sort of fingerprint on this team. That 87 season, though, was uh, an interesting one. The Eagles went 7-8. and eight. That was the year the NFL Week 3 got canceled. And then some te- most teams played with replacement players. Uh, famously, the Cowboys had a lot of their players cross the picket line. So the Eagles' uh, replacement players were absolutely horrible. So they lost all three games. And kind of, and I I still kind of stand on this hill that I think that the strike and the replacement players really stunted the growth of that team because that's a quarter of the season that that team did not get to play together, did not get to gel, and ultimately really showed in subsequent years. Uh, Reggie White did win the Defensive Player of the Year. 21 sacks in 12 games. Uh, To me, he has the single-season sack record because it wasn't his fault that the NFL went on strike. It wasn't his fault that the they allowed replacement players to cross the picket line. Kudos to Reggie and all the Eagles uh, for standing their ground. Buddy Ryan was basically like, I don't care what you do, all of you do it. So they all decided to stay out. You had some guys crossing the picket line. You had, like I said, Tom Landry saying, hey, I'm going to use this as uh, whatever. He was a jerk at the end of his career. Probably was a jerk at the beginning of his career too. But I digress. Mike Quick and Reggie both made the Pro Bowl that year. That year was the uh, the, the infamous fake kneel uh, against the Cowboys because the Cowboys ran up the score with the replacement players. And Buddy had a memory like an elephant did not forget and did the the fake kneel, got the pass interference to, uh, on the deep ball, and then the Eagles ran in the, the meaningless touchdown at the end of the game, which really reignited the entire Eagles-Cowboys rob, uh, rivalry. But yeah, Tom Landry, not a fan, not a fan. Uh, another interesting tidbit from this game, though, that... I was unable to find, mostly because I thought of it when I was in the shower and didn't have time to do the research, Uh, but one of the few times that there were two black starting quarterbacks in a game for an NFL team uh, during that time, if you remember anything, there was the negative connotation still that black quarterbacks were not uh, mentally equipped to be starting quarterbacks in the NFL, which... For Washington's credit, even though they're a division rival, they won the Super Bowl with Doug Williams, which was a huge moment in the evolution of getting black quarterbacks the credit that they, quite honestly, should have had anyway. Uh, But the fact that Randall and Doug Williams squared off in this game uh, was a big, big deal. Uh, But 87, like I said, was one of those years that I think if you don't have those four games, do they start the season out differently in 1988? Who knows? Uh, but they we'll see. But one of the uh, it was a fun season once the strike was over because like I said, Reggie White was just dominant and that whole Eagles defense uh, that was so great in 1991, this is really planting the seeds for that defense during that 1987 season. But on this day, back in 1987, Eagles lost to Washington to open the season 34-24 down in D.C. Young team made a ton of mistakes, but you could see just this was, like I said, this was the first team I vividly and uh, really remember uh, clearly watching and being invested in. I've talked on this podcast before. Uh, uh, My grandparents used to always give us the the little football handbooks that came out of the Miller Lite uh, cases. And you, I remember checking the scores and making sure that uh, I was getting the – and it was different back then because you didn't have the internet. So you had to watch the post-game show and, and write down or, or check in the newspaper the next day. But that really is one of those things that – this 1987 season sparked my passion for the NFL. Um, 
thanks in large part, I will say, to to my grandparents for for giving us those little handbooks and just remember reading about it and I remember being so mad about the strike and writing scabs in, on those uh, replacement day games. But on this day in 1987, that was a nice little uh, anecdote that didn't mean to go down that, but uh, always brings me joy talking about my grandparents and I just remember as a kid filling out those the scores in that but on this day in 1987 the eagles lost to the redskins 34 24 down in dc to open the season but the the seeds were planted for the the subsequent years with buddy ryan in that defense all right as as much as i love talking about my grandparents and those miller light handbooks it's time to talk about philly villains and to me the ultimate Philly sports villain, that is Ben Simmons. He was the number one pick in 2016, sat out his first year. I forget whether it was his back or his, I think he broke his foot or something. Uh, rookie of the year, three-time All-Star, two-time All-Defensive First Team, all of the talent and potential in the world, but he pissed it all away, uh, forgot how to shoot or got scared to shoot, and it just it went all downhill despite how much potential this dude had. And, and quite honestly, what a waste. Absolutely, what a waste of talent just because uh, he doesn't want to put in the effort or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, more on that in a minute. But I will say, back to the shooting, raise your hand if you fell for the stupid Instagram workout videos every single offseason. I, I probably can go back through my phone and show you receipts. 100% I was one of them. I'm like, this is the year. If he can just be a threat to shoot. And instead of getting better, he got worse. And even if he could not shoot, I could accept that. I, I, I was fine with his deficiencies. I was fine with different things. Be a slasher. Be a good defender. Whatever. Run the point. I, I could accept all that. Until that stinking game seven against the uh, Hawks when he literally ran away from an open shot. That dude was standing. Well, first of all, the dunk that he gave up was like that cost him the game. Doc called him out for it. Joel called him out for it. And then he got all caught up in his feelings. And uh, just and then he tried to use injury, oh, this and that. And and I don't want to make light of mental health because I am a big proponent of getting your mental health right. I, I just feel like he was at that point grasping for anything to, to not lose money. And um, I mean, and again, if he does have issues with his mental health back then and he needed the help, I get it. it there's a stigma with it. But like go to somebody behind the door the scenes because he didn't go to the Sixers with any of this until well after the fact when he was suspended and this and that. And that's to me what bothers me. Like have your agent or somebody talk to them, keep it off the record or something. And I, I will never forgive him for that because I, I just, I, I uh, just it, it gets so irritating because I can still just picture the play in my head. You had a wide open dunk. Like, it wasn't even like you had to shoot a layup. It was a dunk, and you ran. And I remember sitting in Cape May with my father-in-law, being pissed off because he all he kept doing, like, he would dribble the ball up, pass it off, and st they were playing four on five. And and part of that is on Doc Rivers, You, which I don't want to get into a Doc Rivers because I don't. he did not make the list of villains, but he certainly could be on there. But, like, it's just... Irritating. Uh, ben Simmons wasted potential. Ultimately, was traded for Harden, um, and we, we know how that worked out. And Ben Simmons is still doing the same shit. Where I don't, even, I guess he's still in Brooklyn now. But it's just what a waste of talent. What a waste of a pick. Um, and, and truthfully, I mean, at the time, that was the consensus number one pick. So I, I don't blame the Sixers for taking him. We have the benefit of hindsight here. But, man, what a waste. And I just, like I said, I'm not making light of the mental health aspect of that because 100% get it. But I just feel as though he went through every other excuse first. And then he was like, oh, if I say this, I can get out of it. 
Maybe I'm being too hard on him. Maybe I don't know what was going on inside of his head. And and that's a very, very valid point. I just feel like there were other ways he could have communicated with the Sixers that he was having those mental health issues than the way he did. So, again, I don't want to make light of that because get it right, Ben, if that was the problem. I just feel like it was sort of a last-ditch effort to try to be like, hey, okay, don't find me now. And Ben Simmons, Philadelphia sports villain. I could go on and on and on about my frustration with Ben. Like I still, like I said, I will never get that play against the Hawks in Game 7 out of my head because it was the, the, the worst play I think I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot being a Philly fan. Worst play I've ever seen anybody do in a big situation or any situation for that matter. But that leads to the question of the day. And you can take this however you want. You can take it, guys that, like we've been doing with Philadelphia ties that became villains, or even opposing players. Because I I don't think there's anyone bigger. Is Ben Simmons the biggest Philly sports villain ever? I mean, and you can go back to any of the opposing, like any of the Cowboys, Irvin, Emmitt Smith, uh, Chipper Jones, um, uh, Brian Braun, any of those guys, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, like is Ben Simmons the biggest Philly sports villain? I think he is, and I don't think it's even close. I really, really don't. Like Kasparitis, uh, Scott Stevens, uh, Mario Lemieux, all of them. Like I will put Ben Simmons over them. But let me know what you think. Give me a call on the Back to the Future voice and text line, 267-495-8531. That'll get you in. Is Ben Simmons the biggest Philly sports villain of all time? In my book, absolutely. On this day, back in 1987, Eagles lost to Washington 34-24 to open the season. But the seeds were planted for those fun Buddy Ryan teams. And I do want to say I apologize for using the, the old name for the Washington team. Um, it, it, it is in the history, but I, I still feel it's a very derogatory name. I should not have used that, so I do apologize for saying that. Uh, just got transfer, transported back to 1987, which that was their name back then. Uh, so if I, I just apologize for that. I shouldn't have used that, that term. Uh, but on this day, Eagles lost to Washington 34-24 after falling behind but battling back but couldn't overcome their mistakes. And and again, it's a young team. That's what they were. But this was really the game that ignited my my passion for Eagles football. Mishkov makes his debut. Phillies Mets cannot wait. Mike, coming for you, brother. Be ready because you're going to be sad. We all know how... The, the Mets play in September. Uh, I, I like to say all the time, Mets going to Met. So here we go. It starts this weekend. I will be glued to that as we get ready for Eagles Falcons on Monday Night Football. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give me your thoughts on Ben Simmons being the biggest Philly sports villain of all time. 267-495-8531. That'll get you in. It is a feel-good Friday. Phillies Mets. The weather is beautiful. Go have yourselves a Friday. This has been This Day in Philly Sports History for September 13th, 2024. My name is Jim Montgomery, and until next time, I'll see you when I see you.